Hello, this is Audio Anarchy Radio, continuing with our series that introduces various concepts from anarchist perspectives. Today, we are going to be talking about property. When speaking of property, a good place to begin is with John Locke, the 17th century English philosopher. Locke was one of the first political philosophers to think about the nature of property. He struggled with the concept of private property, given that he believed God gave the earth to mankind, not certain individuals. In his words, quote, God gave the world to men in common, but since he gave it to them for their benefit and the greatest conveniences of life they were capable to draw from it, it cannot be supposed he meant it should always remain common and uncultivated. He gave it to the use of the industrious and rational, and labor was to be his title to it, not to the fancy or covetousness of the quarrelsome and contentious. He that had his good left for his improvement, as was already taken up, needed not complain, ought not to meddle with what was already improved by another's labor. If he did, it is plain he desired the benefit of another's pains, which he had no right to, and not the ground which God had given him in common with others to labor on, and whereof there was as good left as that already possessed, and more than he knew what to do with, or his industry could reach to." End quote. So it is not the land that God has given us that an individual is laying claim to, but rather the product of an individual's labor. By claiming property, we are claiming individual entitlement to the product of the work that we do, not the common gift of God. By his logic, a plowed field has value because of the labor that one invested in plowing it, and that is why one would claim it as his or her own. Locke makes it clear that this is based on the assumption that there is always, quote, good left. In his words, quote, nor was this appropriation of any parcel of land, by improving it, any prejudice to any other man, since there was still enough, and as good left, and more than the yet unprovided could use, so that, in effect, there was nevertheless left for others, because of his enclosure for himself. For he that leaves as much as another can make use of, does as good as take nothing at all. Nobody could think himself injured by the drinking of another man, though he took a good draught, who had a whole river of the same water left to quench his thirst. And the case of land and water, where there is enough of both, is perfectly the same. End quote. He continues to add that the process of enclosure actually helped to preserve the state of abundance. He claims that a man can live on 10 acres of cultivated land, where he would most likely require 100 acres of uncultivated land in order to maintain the same level of sustenance. Hence, when one encloses 10 acres of common land, one is not taking 10 acres, but giving 90. Of course, at this point, we're only talking about the means that one uses to sustain oneself. In his words, quote, Before the appropriation of land, he who gathered as much of the wild fruit, killed, caught, or tamed as many of the beasts as he could, he that so employed his pains about any of the spontaneous products of nature, as any way to alter them from the state which nature put them in, by placing any of his labor on them, did thereby acquire a propriety in them. But if they perished in his possession without their due use, if the fruits rotted or the venison putrefied before he could spend it, he offended against the common law of nature and was liable to be punished. He invaded his neighbor's share, for he had no right farther than his use called for any of them, and they might serve to afford him conveniences of life. The same measures governed the possession of land too. Whatsoever he tilled and reaped, laid up and made use of, before it spoiled, that was his peculiar right. Whatsoever he enclosed and could feed and make use of, the cattle and product was also his. But if either the grass of his enclosure rotted on the ground, or the fruit of his planting perished without gathering and laying up, this part of the earth, notwithstanding his enclosure, was still to be looked on as waste and might be the possession of any other. End quote. So did you hear that? This bourgeois thinker who influenced the very foundations of the United States and all subsequent property law asserts that all those companies who are filling their dumpsters with unsold produce every night, as well as the United States government itself, which subsidizes agriculture by buying up surplus grain and letting it rot away in silos, is stealing from us. Even from Locke's bourgeois perspective, he's calling us to the barricades right now. Locke admits that the introduction of money into society changed the shape of property. Using money, it becomes possible for one to freeze one's labor into a durable form represented by precious metals, or in the case of today, currency. Once this possibility was introduced, the potential size of an individual's enclosure is no longer limited by fruits, vegetables, or livestock that will rot away in time. 
Whereas before, if I used a thousand acres to grow fruit that would rot away before I could eat it all, I was stealing from the common gift of God. If, on the other hand, I trade all of my surplus fruit for precious metals, which are durable and will not rot, I have wasted nothing. Locke imagines a large island where there is an incredible abundance of resources, but nothing that is so scarce or durable that it could be used as a form of money. On this island, Locke realizes, there would never be any incentive for an individual to use more land than one would require for one's personal needs, because there would be no way to crystallize any extra labor performed into a more durable format. So here Locke is admitting that the emergence of money and trade threw a crimp into his logic on property. But he continues to rationalize his justifications by claiming that since gold and silver have no inherent value beyond what we've bestowed on them, all of us have voluntarily consented to this expansion of property by agreeing to accept the value of currency. In his words, quote, But since gold and silver, being little useful to the life of man in proportion to food, raiment, and carriage, has its value only from the consent of man, whereof labor yet makes in great part the measure, it is plain, that men have agreed to a disproportionate and unequal possession of the earth, they having, by a tacit and voluntary consent, found out a way how a man may fairly possess more land than he himself can use the product of, by receiving in exchange for the overplus gold and silver, which may be hoarded up without injury to anyone, these metals not spoiling or decaying in the hands of the possessor. End quote. So, this is about as far as Locke can take us. Pierre-Joseph Proudhon was a 19th century thinker who questioned the bourgeois foundations of property. He was the first person to call himself an anarchist, claiming that anarchy is order. He was referring to what he called the natural order of true unity from below, rather than a false unity brought about by constraint. The phrase anarchy is order is thought to be the origin of the circle A. He is well known for exclaiming that property is theft, and starts his book What is Property by saying, if I were asked to answer the following question, what is slavery, and I should answer it in one word, it is murder, my meaning would be understood at once. No extended argument would be required to show that the power to take from a man his thought, his will, his personality, is a power of life and death, and that to enslave a man is to kill him. Why then, to this other question, what is property, may I not likewise answer, it is robbery, without the certainty of being misunderstood the second proposition being no more than a transformation of the first." End quote. Proudhon's thoughts on property depend on a distinction between property and possession. For him, property is ownership by a landowner or a capitalist that is derived from conquest or exploitation and is maintained through the state, property laws, and an army. On the other hand, possession is ownership of a home, land to cultivate, or tools of a trade that excludes control over the lands and lives of others. In his words, quote, There are different kinds of property. First, property pure and simple, the dominant and seniorial power over a thing, or, as they term it, naked property. Second, possession. The tenant, the farmer, the usufructuary, or possessors. The owner who lets and lends for use, the heir who is to come into possession on the death of a usufructuary, are proprietors. If I may venture a comparison, a lover is a possessor, a husband is a proprietor. This double definition of property, domain, and possession is of the highest importance, and it must be clearly understood in order to comprehend what is to follow. End quote. Proudhon wonders how property became an accepted natural right. When categorized along with natural rights like life and liberty, property doesn't seem to fit in. Where he sees things like life and liberty as inherent immutable components of humanity, he sees something like property as a specific creation of proprietors. He investigates the basis for property as a natural right, starting with Locke's justification on the basis of labor. To this, he asks, quote, Why is not this principle universal? Why is the benefit of this pretended law confined to a few and denied to the mass of laborers? Why does the tenant no longer acquire through his labor the land which was formerly acquired by the labor of the proprietor? I prove that those who do not possess today are proprietors by the same title as those who do possess. But instead of inferring, therefore, that property should be shared by all, I demand its entire abolition. End quote. In response to a justification of property such as, quote, some laborers are employed in draining marshes and cutting down trees and brushwood, in a word, in cleaning up the soil, 
They increase the value. They make the amount of property larger. They are paid for the value which they add in the form of food and daily wages. It then becomes the property of the capitalist. End quote. Proudhon responds, quote, The price is not sufficient. The labor of the workers has created a value. Now this value is their property. But they have neither sold nor exchanged it. And you, capitalist, you have not earned it. That you should have a partial right to the whole in return for the materials that you have furnished and the provisions that you have supplied is perfectly just. You contributed to the production, you ought to share in the enjoyment. But your right does not annihilate that of the laborers, who, in spite of you, have been your colleagues in the work of production. Why do you talk of wages? The money with which you pay the wages of the laborers remunerates them for only a few years of the perpetual possession which they have abandoned to you. Wages is the cost of the daily maintenance and refreshment of the laborer. You are wrong in calling it the price of a sale. The working man has sold nothing. He knows neither his right nor the extent of the concession which he has made to you, nor the meaning of the contract which you pretend to have made with him. On his side, utter ignorance. On yours, error and surprise, not to say deceit and fraud. In this century of bourgeois morality, in which I have had the honor to be born, the moral sense is so debased that I should not be at all surprised if I were asked by many a worthy proprietor what I see in this that is unjust and illegitimate. Debased creature, galvanized corpse, how can I expect to convince you if you cannot tell robbery when I show it to you? Under the pretext that he has paid his laborers, that he owes them nothing more, that he has nothing to gain by putting himself at the service of others, while his own occupations claim his attention, he refuses to acknowledge his own justification for property. And when, in the imp impotence of their isolation, these poor laborers are compelled to sell their birthright, he, this ungrateful proprietor, this knavish upstart, stands ready to put the finishing touch to their deprivation and their ruin. And you think that just? Take care. End quote. Finally, in response to Locke's justifications, Proudhon exclaims, God give the earth to the human race. Why then have I received none? He has put all things under my feet, and I have not where to lay my head. Multiply, he tells us. That is as easy as to do as to say. But you must give moth to the bird for its nest. End quote. Proudhon goes on to examine the justifications of property based on the concept of original occupancy. At this he exclaims, Property was the first of rights, just as submission to authority was the most holy of duties. When a contemporary of Proudhon attempted to justify property through original occupancy by claiming, quote, My liberty needs for its objective action material to work upon. In other words, property or a thing. This thing or property naturally participates then in the inviolability of my person. For instance, I take possession of an object which has become necessary and useful in the outward manifestation of my liberty. I say this object is mine, since it belongs to no one else. Consequently, I possess it legitimately. So the legitimacy of possession rests on two conditions. First, I possess only as a free being. Suppress free activity, you destroy my power to labor. Now it is only by labor that I can use this property or thing, and it is only by using it that I possess it. Free activity is then the principle of the right of property. But that alone does not legitimate possession. All men are free. All can use property by labor. Does that mean that all men have a right to all property? Not at all. To possess legitimately, I must not only labor and produce in my capacity of a free being, but I must also be the first to occupy the property. In short, if labor and production are the principle of the right of property, the fact of first occupancy is its indispensable condition. End quote. To this Proudhon responds, quote, Well, is it not true from this point of view that if the liberty of man is sacred, it is equally sacred in all individuals? That if it needs property for its objective action, that is, for its life, the appropriation of material is equally necessary for all? That if I wish to be respected in my right of appropriation, I must respect others and theirs, and consequently, that though in the sphere of the infinite, a person's power of appropriation is limited only by himself, in the sphere of the finite, the same power is limited by the mathematical relation between the numbers of persons and the space which they occupy. Does it not follow that if one individual cannot prevent another, his fellow man, from appropriating an amount of material equal to his own, no more can he prevent individuals yet to come? Because while individuality passes away, universality persists and the eternal laws cannot be determined by a partial view of their manifestations. Must we not conclude, therefore, 
that whenever a person is born, the others must crowd closer together, and by reciprocity of their obligation, that if the newcomer is afterwards to become an heir, the right of succession does not give him the right of accumulation, but only the right of choice? If the right of life is equal, the right of labor is equal, and so is the right of occupancy. Would it not be criminal were some islanders to repulse, in the name of property, the unfortunate victims of a shipwreck struggling to reach the shore? The very idea of such cruelty sickens the imagination. The proprietor, like Robinson Crusoe on his island, wards off with pike and musket the proletaire washed overboard by the waves of civilization, and seeking to gain a foothold upon the rocks of property. Give me work, cries he with all his might to the proprietor. Don't drive me away. I will work for you at any price. I do not need your services, replies the proprietor, showing the end of his pike or the barrel of his gun. Lower my rent at least. I need my income to live upon. How can I pay you when I can get no work? That is your business. Then the unfortunate proletaire abandons himself to the waves, or if he attempts to land upon the shore of property, the proprietor takes aim and kills him. The right of property, provided it can have a cause, can have but one. I can possess by several titles. I can become proprietor only by one. The field which I have cleared, which I cultivate, on which I have built my house, which supports myself, my family, and my livestock, I can possess. First, as the original occupant. Second, as a laborer. Third, by virtue of the social contract which assigns it to me as my share. But none of these titles confer upon me the right of property. For, if I attempt to base it upon occupancy, society can reply, I am the original occupant. If I appeal to my labor, it will say, it is only on that condition that you possess. If I speak of agreements, it will respond, these agreements establish only your right of use. Such, however, are the only titles which proprietors advance. They never have been able to discover any others. Indeed, every right supposes a producing cause in the person who enjoys it. But in man who lives and dies, in the son of earth who passes away like a shadow, there exists, with respect to external things, only titles of possession, not one title of property. Why, then, has society recognized a right injurious to itself, where there is no producing cause? Why, in according possession, has it also conceded property? Why has the law sanctioned this abuse of power? End quote. There is, of course, a major distinction between what Proudhon was advocating and the likes of the state socialists. As he said, instead of inferring therefrom that property should be shared by all, I demand its entire abolition. Proudhon considered the state socialists of the time to be the worst proprietors, seeing state ownership as the most degenerative case of capitalist exploitation. In his words, quote, I see in it a barrier to liberty, the free disposition of the soil taken away from him who cultivates it, and this precious sovereignty forbidden to the citizen and reserved for that fictitious being without intelligence, without passion, without morality that we call the state. By this arrangement, the occupant has less to do with the soil than before. The clod of earth seems to stand up and say to him, you are only a slave of the taxes. I do not know you. End quote. Proudhon was also opposed to libertarian notions of collectivism. He only favored association where association was necessary, as the organic combination of forces, operations that required specialization and many different workers performing their individual tasks to complete a unified product required association. This is because the workers would be inherently dependent on each other, and without association, the workers are related as subordinate and superior, master and wage slave. Proudhon considered this to be free association and did not favor what he called the cult of association, which would require everyone to collectivize for the sake of collectivization. He felt that operations which could be performed by an individual, such as the artisan or peasant, without the help of specialized workers, did not require association. This is the origin of his saying that property is freedom, where here he is referring to property as possession. Peter Kropotkin was one of the first proponents of anarchist communism. He looked at the world of individual autonomy and personal possession that Proudhon had imagined and further questioned its basis. He noted that all of society's labor was intimately tied together in a myriad of ways, and that even apparently isolated groups were not functioning as autonomously as they seemed. He pointed out that even the peasant farmer or isolated artisan was dependent on roads and the bridges made in common, the swamps drained by common toil, and the communal pastures enclosed by hedges which were kept in repair by each and all. If the looms for weaving or the dyes for coloring fabrics were improved, all profited. 
So even in those days, a peasant family could not live alone, but was dependent in a thousand ways on the village or the commune. He continued that in the industrializing world, these connections are even more complicated and tight-knit. Kropotkin felt that this demonstrated the instruments of labor to be a common inheritance, and that this was in direct contradiction to wages or even collectivist remuneration. He felt that the common possession of the instruments of labor must necessarily bring with it the enjoyment in common of the fruits of common labor. He saw enough for everyone and proposed that those currently in control of property were resting on a centuries-old foundation of appropriated common labor. He thought that the amount of work necessary to track people's ongoing labor was less efficient than just having a fully communitarian society where everything was freely available to everyone. So contrary to Proudhon, Kropotkin did not feel that one was entitled to the product of one's labor, but rather to whatever one's needs may be. Kropotkin advocated a gift economy where everything would be available to anyone. He often pointed out that in situations of crisis, people regularly banded together to help each other and lend services without thought of remuneration, often with amazing and beautiful results. He imagined a world where everyone was always united by such a common cause. In conclusion, there's a long history of anarchist thought on the nature of property and possession. Proudhon has interesting ideas about property existing both as an act of theft and a liberating force. Kropotkin has interesting ideas about the interconnectedness of it all and of the potentials for a beautiful communitarian world. To me, even the writings of Locke are interesting because at least this bourgeois philosopher was even thinking about the origins and rights of private property. This is a far cry from today's world, where large social questions are no longer discussed. There are no more promises, no more ideas. People are not continuing to work because they have been promised the hope of an eventual better life. By and large, those in America today have accepted the conditions and parameters of their lives and are operating within that framework. The politicians don't even have to lie about promises of alternatives. The questions they do ask are meaningless because the method is false. If asked for a justification of private property, those of the established order would not speak of basis, inequality, liberty, or justice. They would simply reply that private property is necessary for capitalism, and that would be sufficient, because nobody is imagining anything else. That's it for our discussion on property. Check out Audio Anarchy on the web at audioanarchy.org. <laughs>